Thank you. Um, would you like to learn what Spark is good at? Or what kind of pitfalls you can face when running it? By the end of this talk, you will have an overview of common Spark use cases, but also understanding of how it works under the hood and how to use that knowledge in practice. My name is Marcin. I uh, work at Tantus Data. At Tantus Data, we do basically everything data related, so from cluster installation through application architecture, ML training. And uh, I've been doing all of that, but on a daily basis, I act as a data engineer. During this talk, first of all, I'll tell you what Spark is, and then we very quickly jump into use case overview. So I'll show you a few use cases which should give you broad enough uh, overview of what you can use Spark for and whether you see any similarities to use cases you have in mind and whether Spark will be useful for you or not. And then we will have a look at our Spark architecture. We'll look at how certain uh, um, operations are implemented and how to use this knowledge in practice in order to build reliable Spark jobs. And at the end, there will be a um, brief overview of the big picture, the big picture from the point of view of uh, technology, but also a big picture from the point of view of, um, of teams like data pipelines teams and uh, what to pay attention to. So Spark is a general engine for distributed data processing, which means you can express your business logic, your pipeline in one of these languages, and Spark will take care of distributing the processing. So Spark is not a database, it's a processing engine, and you can you use data from, from multiple different sources like Cassandra, HDFS, uh, Cloud. And let's get started with use cases. The first use case is a mobile app company. So imagine you build a mobile app. So you have some backend talking to the mobile app and, and, and to a database. And you want to improve your application. So you want to understand how your customers are behaving. So you start storing some events. So what kind of events we are talking about? We are talking about pretty much everything your user is doing. So scrolling through the screen, clicking on a button. So then your analysts, you connect to the databases event, uh, can tell you, OK, why this customer went to the premium page, but he never became premium. Maybe the application has failed, or maybe the flow was too complex and basically he gave up. So you answer these kind of questions. Everything goes well. Your user base is growing. But eventually, your user base is so big that your database cannot keep up anymore. You have all this army of analysts who are just sitting and waiting for the queries to return, and you want to solve this problem. It's a technical problem, but still you, you have to solve it. And fortunately, this kind of problem has already been solved out there. And there are many, many different approaches, but the general idea is that you want to get rid of single point of failure. You want to distribute, uh, distribute your storage. You can use some cloud solution. You can use HDFS, which is a distributed file system. And for processing of the data, you can use Spark. So from now on, your analysts are exposed to the Spark API. So speaking of the Spark API, this is what it looks like. I'm not going to go through details. I'll just emphasize this group by, max, average, join, select. If you know SQL, you get the idea of what this code is doing. And we, when you have this kind of interface, you can easily express all kind of general standard use cases. So doing ETL extract, transform, load. You get data from multiple sources in different file formats. You do the processing and you dump the data into some single single place uh, in unified format. So it's a single source of truth for all kind of analytical purposes. Or calculating your KPIs so you know how 
well you are doing with acquisition, how well you are doing with revenue. And many other general use cases, so calculating A-B test results, anonymizing your large data sets because you care about users' privacy, calculating frauds, uh, churn statistics, uh, calculating uh, feature set for your machine learning projects. But I want to focus on two more use cases which are a little bit more complex and a little bit more specific. So first one would be telco network improvement. So when you, when you as a customer of a telco walk with your phone, you are connected to one of the, one of the base stations, and then depends on which base station you are connected to, you get different experience, different throughput, and so on. So it depends on what hardware you are connected to and how crowded the base station is, and so on. And what we would like to do here is we would like to improve the user experience, so hopefully the, 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 the happier customer is more loyal customer. And you do these kind of exercises in multiple steps, so there are many things you have to do. You have to come up with a score which represents the network quality for a given customer. You have to come up with churn prediction model, so you understand whether network quality is anyhow related with, with customer loyalty. Uh, you simulate how your network will behave after upgrading given base station based on the on the hardware um, hardware statistics, and by the end of the day, you apply the simulated network score to the churn prediction model, so you know whether it makes sense to to improve the network in a given place or not. So just for steps, but these steps are extremely complex from the point of view of the domain understanding, but also they are extremely complex from the point of view of the data you have to process. So you collect probes from the network from every single base station for each customer, so you end up with a lot of data, and uh, that's where Spark helps you. That's uh, what Spark can help you with, so it will help you out with distributing the, the processing of all, of, the, all, of all this massive data set. And you might ask, OK, but why don't I just take some sample or an aggregate and take it to my local machine or take it to, to some powerful Python server? When you deal with a sample, an aggregate, you limit your data set, and you might end up with this blind man and an elephant problem. So an, a few blind men are touching an elephant, and they get completely wrong idea about what the elephant is. Something similar can happen with your data. If you are using a distributed system like Spark instead, you can analyze all the data, you can do faster analysis, and also you do not have to make any extra copies because Spark kind of, kind of moves the analysis into the data, not the other way around, so you don't create any extra copies and it's important from the point of view of users' privacy. One more, a little bit different example of, uh, of Spark use case is uh, processing geospatial data. So imagine you want to build a general map service like Google Maps, or imagine you are building self-driving cars and you want to have a map which you control, which you 100% rely on. If you do that, then you most likely have to combine data from many different sources. From the car which is going around the street and taking pictures and you blend it with AI in order to figure out the road name or, or the signs on the road. Um, geo, uh, geospatial repos which are open source, there are such, so why not to use it? You can buy some data from vendors because you know some vendors have good uh, postal repos in a given country. Or editors. You need an army of editors if you build them up, an army of editors who are looking into satellite pictures, they react for customers' bug reports, and so on. And the whole point is here is that you combine all that data and you build new, better version of your map, 
and you do, do that over and over again. You have to iterate and you want to do it fast. You want to get a fast feedback loop. So just to give you an example of uh, what kind of operations you will have to do, you have two road segments and you want to make sure there is no, no, a, no not a gap in the road. You, you have to do the stitching if those road segments are coming from different sources. Or you have to update information about newly opened coffee house or you need to update information about access point to the building because you don't like when you order an Uber, you go to ad an address and then you have to walk for half a mile still. So when you have a map like that and you want to, you want to process the idea is super simple, you basically uh, split the map into, into the sectors, you define the, the way of splitting and then Spark takes care for you of processing these sectors on different machines, different JVMs. And in this use case, it's slightly, slightly different from the previous one because in this use case, the data size we are talking about is not that large, but the processing is extremely uh, CPU, CPU heavy, so you're gaining the, the CPU power here. So just a quick recap of the, of the use cases. Spark can help you if you have some massive data sets to process or if you want to throw many CPUs and you are looking for, uh, for a way of distributing the load. It gives you sp uh, SQL, SQL interface if, you, if you, we are talking about analytics use cases, uh, so uh, it's quite, quite easy to, to get started with. If you have some more complex logic to express and if you want lower level control, uh, you get functional programming kind of interface as well. Okay, but enough of use cases. I would like to do a deep dive into how Spark works, how certain functions are implemented, and why would you care? I would like you to have better disaster recovery plan than this one. And why are we talking about disaster recovery plans? Because when I work with clients, I can see that they quite easily can implement the logic in Spark. They can quite easily get around the, 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 the interface. But then when they go to production data set, which is larger than what they used for testing, then they end up with problems. And for some of Spark operations, you need to understand how they work in order to, to be efficient. So let's get started with some basics. When you work with, uh, with a data set in Spark, it's partitioned. It's kind of hidden from you, but we are talking about partitioned data set all the time and uh, data sets which are on multiple machines. And then when Spark does transformations, it can do uh, different types of transformation. The first one is simple. So imagine you are doing two up uppercase on a string record, you can do it one by one, right? So you do not have to mix data between multiple partition, it does it partition by partition. And because they are quite simple, Spark can pipeline many, many transformations like that, and it creates a task for multiple simple transformations, transformations which can be done on one partition at a time. So task is the most granular unit of execution in Spark. But you can also have transformations which are a little bit more complex. Imagine you are grouping uh, events by user ID. Events number one will go to one place. Events number two will go to another partition and so on. So we are mixing data from multiple input partition into one partition. And in that case, that means you have to read the data across the network. You need to, uh, you need to ba basically combine uh, data from, from the entire data set. And this uh, kind of operation is called shuffle. So from 10,000 feet, the Spark application looks like the following. You get an input data set which is partitioned. Spark tries to pipeline as many simple operations as possible, but eventually you do a join, you do a group by, some more complex operation when Spark has to shuffle the data. 
and probably you do that multiple times. So Spark application consists of multiple stages and multiple shuffles in between them. So just to give you an idea of how Spark... Can I get some... Okay, never mind. Uh, just to give you an idea uh, how Spark parallelized the load, let's see, let's have a look at simplest scenario ever. You read some data, that data contains a timestamp, and out of this timestamp you would like to calculate a year, a month, and a day the event has happened in. So what Spark will do, it will, single Spark task will read chunk of your data, it will calculate the year, month, and the day on the fly, because it can, it can do that, there is no need to, to split those activities. And when you request Spark to save the result, it will just do that, it will create a new file for you. And the question here will be, how many files like, uh, how many tasks like that will you have? Imagine you have a terabyte of data in 1,000 files, eight blocks per file, then it will be like 8,000 blocks and 8,000 tasks. 8,000 tasks which look exactly the same. There are no arrows in between those tasks. There are no dependencies in between those tasks. So they are super easy to parallelize and not much really can go wrong. That's why I called it simplest scenario ever. And each of the tasks is run somewhere in your cluster on a JVM called executors. And all the executors are um, orchestrated by a driver process. How about looking at something more complex? Performing a join of events and users based on user ID. And let's say we have 10 terabytes of events. When Spark does a join, it single task will read chunk of your data and it will organize by the join key, so user ID in our case. So it will write some, um, some, user, some set of user IDs into bucket one and it will store it to local disk. Some of the user IDs will go to bucket two and so on. And then every single task processing the events and processing the users will do exactly the same. So all our data is organized by user ID. And once it's done, Spark will be ready to create another stage, another set of tasks, so that this task will basically pull the bucket one. So bucket one is always responsible for the same set of user IDs, it's consistent, and the partial join can happen in task one, task two, and so on. And again, the question will be how many tasks will we have in stage two? The default is 200, you can control that. And why is it important? When you do the math, you have 10 terabytes of events, 200 tasks, that means 50 gigs per task. We are talking about JVMs, we usually want to keep them keep them much, much smaller. And so 50 gigs uh, of data per uh, task in a JVM is usually too much, and you end up with one of these problems. It, it doesn't necessarily mean Spark will fail. It might spill the data to disk and recover from that, but it will be slow. Or you can see a problem like timeout, GC problems, out of memory, things like that. So what do you do then? First of all, and that's a general comment for all Spark or all data pipeline related problems, is you have to understand your data. I have told you how much data you have and how much data is processed by task. You have to do the math yourself. You have to find a clue for that in Spark UI and so on. But once, uh, once you understand what the problem is, then you can control the level of parallelism so you can increase the 200 number into something larger, whatever suits you. But it's not always that simple. Sometimes you have a skewed join. So you still have 10 terabytes of events, but a single user produced one terabyte of them. So you have this weird behaving user who produced so many events. What will happen then? 
the entire algorithm looks exactly the same, but there will be this single task which processes one terabyte of data and there is no chance it will, it will finish. So what do you do then? Again, you need to understand where the skew is coming from because it might be that your input data is incorrect or maybe you have introduced a bug in your logic so the skew is kind of artificial. But if the skew really exists and you still want to, want to perform the join on a skewed data, you do a little trick. So imagine you are joining events with users and this user ID we user ID one is something you want to avoid. You want to avoid all the ones going to uh, going to a single task. So in you introduce some randomness in your data. You introduce a salt, which is a random value from a given range, and you duplicate all your user IDs. So you for every single user you create a you copy the value with every single possible salt value. And when you do the join, you join not only by user ID, but also by the salt. So user ID 1, salt 1 goes to one place, salt 2 is going to another place, salt 3 is going to another place. So by doing that, you kind of gave a hint to Spark to process parts of your data in different, uh, in different tasks. But once again, you have to know where the skew is coming from. And once you know that, apply the salt. It's super useful. It's more useful that, that, than it sounds. I see this kind of problem very often, and, and, and it's really, really helpful. So it's a nice trick to have in your bag of tricks. Uh, I don't think we have time for caching. And there are many other Spark gotchas I would be happy to talk to you about. So if you want to talk about caching, broadcasting, or in general, like what other problems you might face when running Spark, I would be happy to. And there are other challenges which uh, you probably will face. You are on Spark presentation, so I believe you are interested in, in data. So choosing the right fi file format, how to orchestrate data pipelines, how to deploy machine learning uh, models to production. This is not necessarily coupled to Spark. This is related to any, any kind of data projects, and I would be also happy to discuss them with you. The, the only thing I want to mention is that the technology choice is almost unlimited. You, sh you're, you should not really see what's there. These are logos of different, different projects in the, in the landscape. So uh, there are so many technologies. Be really sure that you really need to introduce a new technology before before you do that, because it kind of becomes um, it, it can really easily go out of hand. So be smart about what technology you are introducing to your to your technology stack, and make sure that all kind of problems you are facing into you you, you f either fix them or you share the knowledge about common problems, about best practices you want to enforce in your, in your organization because um, just because it, it makes sense. But at the same time, make sure there are boundaries between those teams, especially the analysts, the data scientists. They, they are not interested in, in JVM-related problems. So try to, try to kind of hide these problems from them so they can focus on, on the business. The last picture I want to I want to show you for for today is the hierarchy of needs in data science. So the top of this triangle is all these buzzword technologies everybody is talking about: deep learning, machine learning, and that's fine if you want to do some dirty POC, bring the data in a pocket, and if that suits your business, that's fine. But it's not not sustainable in in long as a long-term solution. So if you want to build reliable uh, AI solutions, you have to rely 
you have to be able to rely on your data. You have to make sure the data ingestion mechanisms are correct. They are monitored. They are verified. Three bottom lines for today, three bullet points, would be that Spark can really help you with processing data at scale. It really, really helps if you know how it works under the hood. It can save you from quite many frustrations. And you should think about the, the big picture from day one, about the bottom of the triangle from day one. You should get some discipline when building um, data pipelines because it can quite easily get out of hands. Thank you very much. And I will be happy to, to answer your questions or talk to me afterwards.